Our reading from the Gospel for today ends with these words, where two or three have met together in my name, I am there among them. During this period of staying at home and not meeting, I'm sure most of us have appreciated and valued the contact that television and radio has given. Television has obviously been struggling a bit, buying in some rather curious series and showing lots and lots of repeats. But radio has fared better, it's much easier for it to make contact in various places of the world. Radio in particular brings information and ideas with comparative ease. There's a lovely quote of somebody saying they much preferred the radio because the pictures were better. It can stimulate imagination and that of course is limitless. When the BBC first started broadcasting in 1922, it was a novel and completely unknown principle but people rapidly took to the idea, and indeed by 1939, when the Second World War broke out, it had become an essential way of communicating with the population, and people listened each day to the radio to get the latest news. A few years ago, I was part of a group in what was then the West Yorkshire Methodist District, producing booklets in their uh, prayer book series. Uh, and one of these was uh, a series of meditations where each meditation was based on an object and one of them was the radio. And the final little part of this passage was a, a little story, a little quote about somebody who was asked the question, if you could only say one sentence on the radio to millions of people, what would that question, not what would that sentence be? The lady thought for a moment and then she said, you are not alone. That's a very powerful message and is one way of expressing this text. Jesus said, I am with you. This uh, verse from St Matthew's Gospel is often quoted by people who are rather disappointed by a small congregation or by uh, the low attendance at some church meeting in the very strange circumstances we found ourselves in this year, I thought perhaps we needed a new version. When anyone is self-isolating, I am with them. People who quoted this uh, verse did it when numbers are small and they were trying to cover their embarrassment with a visiting preacher or to console themselves at the disappointing outturn for something. This was not the point of Jesus's words. When the Gospels were written down, gathering together as a Christian could be an extremely dangerous matter. Not the fear of transmitting a virus, but the very real possibility of being arrested, persecuted, killed for the very fact of being a Christian. Being a Christian for the first 300 years of the Church was a dangerous business. Christ's words are important ones of reassurance. But these lovely words come at the end of a less pleasant passage. Most of it is about dealing with problem people. If you've belonged to a church where there has never been any discord or strong disagreement between people, then firstly it's a miracle and it's probably the only church that's such like church that's ever existed. Throughout the church's history, even in the first century, things went wrong in churches. The New Testament letters are full of the upshot. The Gospel tells us how to go about dealing with someone we think has got things wrong starting with a quiet word and then perhaps going on to a shared discussion with the church community and finally if no recon reconciliation can be achieved to accept that that individual has to not jeopardize the rest of the church community. Our reading from the book of Ezekiel is also about dealing with people who've got the message wrong. The instructions and the ideas come in the opposite order. This time it, we start with the ultimate punishment but Ezekiel is told by God that it is his responsibility to try and put people right, tell them when they're wrong and help them on the way, a responsibility which we presume lies on all of us. Finally, God says that he doesn't want anybody to be in the wrong. He says, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no desire for the death of the wicked. I would rather that the wicked should mend his ways and live. It's in the context of difficult situations that we're given this great promise, you're not alone. It's surely something that has much wider significance than the problem areas of church discipline and disharmony. This is a story that I heard some a long time ago. 
and I can't remember where I got it originally, but it goes like this. Albert George Bassenthwaite had always been unswerving in his church attendance. His job at the steelworks was no more than a time-consuming inconvenience. Life revolved around the Ebenezer Chapel. They'd recently had a Bible study on the book of Revelation and Albert had spent hours poring over the Bible with pencil and paper. Of course, said Albert, he's coming soon. He produces pages of calculations. They said to him, no one knows the time or the place, brother. I can only get it down to the last half hour, 2 a.m. on September the 17th. Of course, the mathematics was wrong. People did not know what to do. Suggestions were made that somebody should stay with him, but in the end they were all too embarrassed. And so Albert kept a solitary vigil in his front garden on the night. He waited. Two. Then 2.30. Three. And at 3.30, a sobbing figure came into view. Albert, single and with a very limited experience of life, was not the best person to deal with such a situation, but he was the only person there, and so on his shoulder the woman poured out her story. Albert was lost for words. He'd heard of such things, but he'd no idea how to handle the situation, what to say, what to do. Come on in and I'll make a cup of tea, he said. As Albert busied himself, he forgot his disappointment. He knew in his heart it had been foolish to be certain, however sure it might have seemed. Right, he said, as the kettle began to whistle, tea for two is coming up. And a voice behind him spoke, warm and comfortable. Tea for three of us. He had come, after all. We need to recognise that Jesus comes to us in all sorts of ways, in unexpected guises, and without any pomp or formality of religious ceremony. Surely the message from the Gospel is that Jesus is with us when we feel we're on the back foot, that it's a lot, there's a lot going wrong, that we're outnumbered. It may seem rather strange to use today something for Easter Sunday, but this Easter, when we were in the early stages of this crisis, a poem was written by Malcolm Geit, an Anglican priest, writer and poet. And its words are very powerful and I think embody what I've just tried to say. And where is Jesus this strange Easter day? Not lost in our locked churches any more than he was sealed in that dark sepulchre. The locks are loosed, the stone is rolled away and he is up and risen long before, alive and at large and it's speaking his strong way into the world he gave his life to save. No need to seek him in his empty grave. He might have been a wafer in the hands of priests this day or music from the lips of red-robed choristers. Instead, he slips away from church, shakes off our linen bands to don his apron with a nurse. He grips and lifts a stretcher, soothes with gentle hands the frail flesh of the dying, gives them hope, breathes with the breathless, lends them strength to cope. On Thursday we applauded, for he came and served us in a thousand names and faces, mopping our sick room floors and catching traces of that virus which was death to him. Good Friday happened in a thousand places where Jesus held the helpless, died with them, that they might share his Easter in their need. Now they're risen with him, risen indeed. Jesus said, I am there with them.